country and just go on with that. So um, now what has happened is that the notion of the golden age has been taken over by those who would like to argue ultimately that the only greatness in the Indian past was in the Gupta period because the real reason is not because you have great art and philosophers and writers and so on, but because they regard it as the revival of Brahmanism. That you had a long period in which the Buddhists were powerful and strong and had royal patrons, and as I said, you know, Buddhism and the uh, Shaiva and the Vaishnava sects were equally balanced. But in the Gupta period, you begin to get more and more of the appearance, appearance of Brahmanical sects, the Puranic sects, the Purans are written and so on. Therefore, what they mean by a golden age is not the great glory of scientific uh, investigations of mathematics and that kind of thing. It is the rise of Hinduism as they see it. And this is why, in a sense, one says that uh, A, one is, you know, you, you negate the whole idea of any kind of golden age at any time, as I said, for other reasons. Secondly, it is just not viable to maintain that the greatest golden age, the only golden age, the golden age of Indian history was the Gupta period. That is not viable because in, in different ways other, other ages were, uh, in a sense, greater, if you want to use the term great, which is a rather meaningless term. Yes. Oh, no. I knew this would come. Ram Setu. Uh, this is the same story again as the Babri Masjid. Um, it was not a major issue, neither among believers nor among politicians, until it was decided to use it for political mobilization. And this is what I was referring to when I said that history should not be used for political mobilization. Okay, they used it in the Ram Janambhumi issue and we all said, look, there's no historical evidence. And we were told, uh, you are uh, insulting, kya aap keh rahe hain ke Maryada Pushotam, Ram Maryada Pushotam nahi the, ye nahi the, wo nahi the. And one goes on saying, that is an issue of faith. We are historians we have certain rules by which we argue that this is historically uh, valid or is not valid. We are not impinging on you. We are not saying you have no right to believe. Your faith, your belief is what you believe. You can believe in anything, but please don't say it's historical. The moment you say it's historical, then the historian has to come in and either agree or disagree. And that is what happened with the Ram Janambhumi. They conducted this huge excavation, which went on for months and months and months. And at the end of it, they are unable to prove that this was a site that even had anything to do with the Ramayana. Now, there's a problem with the Ramayana uh, in using it as historical evidence. Because as I said, the nature of epic literature is that you keep on adding bits as you go along. The greatness of all epics is that when they're taken over by people, when, when there is a community that um, listens and participates and want, wants to be part of the story, what does it do? It says, oh yes, uh, Ram and Sita actually came to our forest and they built a kutya in that spot. And so you have a Sita Kund, you have a Ram Lena, whatever it may be. It's the appropriation of geography that becomes sacred and becomes a part of yourself. All right. So the first problem with the Ram Setu is where is the location of Lanka? Um, <clears throat> historians and scholars who have written right through the 20th century have suggested 
various locations. And the majority of the views center around central India, the Amarakantak region, or Orissa, the Mahanadi region. For a variety of reasons, which I won't go into, the evidence that is given, the, the narrative of the Ramayana, seems to agree with these areas more than anything else. Certainly, the equation of Sri Lanka of today with the Lanka of the Ramayana is very, very doubtful. It's doubtful for a variety of